Well, at the outset, thank you very much, the organizers, for giving me this opportunity to be here. Since morning, whenever I was listening to the panel discussion, I think the whole subject is coming the same way that futures cannot depend on case. And every time you have to have a good clinical correlation. And I think uh, my topic is also a testing a test. Uh, the provisional diagnosis is a prerequisite before planning a test. You cannot do a test because you don't understand anything. If you do a test like that, then you will never understand anything at all. You have to have some provisional diagnosis. And I think much before the test results come in, you need to anticipate what are the likelihood of the test results. And I think that is the way you sharpen your clinical skills as well. And I think test alone can't diagnose. In fact, it often confuses. <laughs> Finally, the test must add value. The patient must be definitely benefited. Science must be benefited sometimes. A doctor must be benefited that he has learned. If the test did not really apply to any of these criteria, then the, I think the test was useless. And that's why the majority of the laboratories write finally correlate clinically. They are telling the clinicians to do their job because they cannot help anymore. And I think cost effectiveness is a concern. Again, there has been some mention to that. And I think that's the reason why I felt testing a test is an important issue. You can't just ask the test. This morning I heard about C CRP procalcitonin. Yes, the science has advanced. But has the health been different after the science has advanced? Has procalcitonin meant that the infections are correctly treated in early stage and the patient's cured? My answer is a big no. And if that is so, then what are those tests like? And I would dwell a bit of all of that then. Let me show you this case. These are all real live cases. A six-month-old child, one of the twins, comes with a repeated vomiting. And the other twin is normal. Physical exam is normal. Just now Nathbhushan said vomiting could be due to varieties of reason even outside the gastrointestinal tract. Nobody had even put a growth chart on this baby. Nobody had really realized that the baby was happy in spite of vomiting and was reasonably growing. Both the twins had the similar growth pattern, but no growth was ever charted. This was a twin delivery. Both were of a small weight. And therefore, to parents, the child was small, built, thin, and vomiting. All that you had to pick up was this baby was happy and growing fine in spite of vomiting. The cause must be outside the body and not inside the body. And every test was done. Finally, all, all it meant was that the history was missed. Parents were trying to force fit this male twin, hoping that he will catch up fast. A single question asked when I saw the happy infant with a normal growth chart, do you feed him only when he demands or you decide when to feed him? No sir, he doesn't demand, so we decide. <laughs> now, how simple it could be, several tests were done, a simple history was not taken. I think therefore each time you want to be sure whether there is test necessary. There are many situations where the test is not necessary. Stool examination is not necessary in acute diarrhea at all. How does it help? CBC in a short duration of fever, two days of fever, what does the CBC show? Probably nothing. Yeah, if you are suspecting malaria, yes, you do a peripheral smear. But what do, do the count show? What about NS1 antigen and IgM dengue? Unless you are going to report to your authorities, that there is a ding going on. How do these tests decide? We just heard ding shock, but the serology may be negative. So what? I think we are wasting money on this by doing all these tests. Every viral infection can go on a shock or go on a hemorrhage. How does it matter whether it's ding or not? Unless you are looking at the epidemiology, which most of us do a test and forget even to report. Many of these things are not even reportable. What about throat swap or URTI? It's fine to do an antigen test. Would the clinician not be able to differentiate reasonably? And I think every time when a clinician cannot differentiate, a simple question is, 
is it safe to wait without knowing? And if it is safe to wait, there should be no hurry to do anything. The test will not differentiate viral from bacterial, and it's only the time and the progress that will. Similarly, LFT in acute hepatitis. Typically, 10-year-old child comes with prodrome of nausea, vomiting, etc. Why are you wasting time in doing liver function test as much? Well, unless he gets into some reason, maybe a complication, maybe an atypical presentation. But then many people would get about doing uh, all these tests. This morning we heard on a panel that in an acute pneumonia, uh, there is no need of an extra chest at all. How many times a child who has a recurrent cough has had a chest x-ray, not one but many times, and then somebody reports as pneumonitis, good enough for you to give an antibiotic, and therefore imagine how many chest x-rays are often really not required. I am a strong believer that CT chest is rarely required in pulmonology. I was asking Mahesh Babu in Singapore, he has been there, how often he would feel that a CT chest would be required in pulmonology. It's extremely rare. Look at an average situation where after an X-ray chest I can't understand, I would do a CT chest. My misunderstanding is multiplied that way. But the problems are not solved. And I think some of these tests are. What about the neuroimaging in a cerebral palsy? A cerebral palsy is a clinical diagnosis. And there is no reason for neuroimage. What are you looking at that? Well, there could be a small problem which I mistake as a cerebral palsy. And my simple advice to my students would be that if you have a normal head circumference in a cerebral palsy, or if there is a family history of cerebral palsy, oh, then it's not a cerebral palsy, do an imaging. But barring that, there is no reason to do imaging at all. I'm sure many of us must be doing these tests routinely. And I hope you agree that these are not the tests required at all. I think the, once you do a test, the next burden is a correct interpretation. A test does not tell you exactly what you want to know. And I think the cautious interpretation obviously is required. And since morning we have been hearing on this test that every time it has to be a clinical correlation. You need to have a clinical profile and if there is an unexpected test result, then simply you should not act upon that. Many clinicians would believe a laboratory test rather than themselves. And I think that is not right. You need to be also sure. Laboratory has only one time a sample testing. A clinician has all the time a time to see the progress, a repeated examination, maybe a detailed history. And how can a laboratory test go over a clinician's impression. Well, there is a reason therefore not to back, act in a hurry, but in case of discrepancy, really look at again clinically and see whether that is to be taken. And I think tests may have to be also repeated for verification. <clears throat> but wherever there is a test repeated, a question always looms hard whether the first test was right or another, and I think that doesn't often solve the problem. Let me take you to some of the live cases where a good interpretation made a lot of difference and not just blindly follow the situation. But this was an eight-year-old child who presented with high fever for last three days. No other symptom, no change, physical examination, not toxic, no localization. You get this kind of account, 20,000 count, 78% quality. What does it mean? Even such a count does not tell you anything at all. Most of the counts are on the borderline anyway. But this is obviously an abnormal count. And if you go by a scientific evidence, it would say that if the count is more than 15,000, there is a high chance of a bacterial infection, which means there is a low chance of no bacterial infection. Mm -hmm. How are you taking a chance? This means nothing at all. And to that extent, chest x-ray was not advised. Chest x-ray showed a middle lobe haziness a diagnosis of pneumonia. But don't forget that he is not even toxic and he has no localizing sign. What kind of bacterial pneumonia is this? The child is not sick and the child doesn't have clinical signs and therefore you gave an IV septrioxone because the counts guided you, the chest x-ray guided you. What is chest x-ray showing haziness? It means very little. Haziness is not a diagnosis, it could be anything. And to that extent when there was no change, you repeat the count. 
counts have gone higher, so what do you do? You upgrade an antibiotic if you like. But some wise person said, maybe the pneumonia has become an empyema now. So he repeats the chest x-ray and the chest x-ray is clear. <laughs> now the problem comes up. Okay, that what is this? Now how can a chest x-ray of a pneumonia clear? We all know that it takes few weeks to clear, even after the patient clears his disease. So this obviously not. The point to make is that if you look at the first count itself, then you knew that there was no eosinopenia. Many acute infections, be bacterial or viral, have an eosinopenia. Of course, it means that a conscientious pathologist has given you the report. And many automated chambers today now do not give eosinopenia separately. They give polys, lymphos and the rest. And the rest has to be seen by a pathologist on a slide. And if the rest are poor, he needs to say, eosinophils and monocytes and put some number. But if there was no eosinopenia, that was a marking a little different that, oh, he's doing something else. He's not toxic. How can a pneumonia be not toxic with that account? And therefore, this was simply a vector. It's not important what it turned out to be. Again, how cautious interpretation would make a difference. Another six-year-old child present with high fever and Within 12 hours, gets an acutely breathless. On examination, he has a massive pleural effusion. His peripheral counts are very high. Pleural fluid is very hazy and also has a high count. Considered as an empire. Why? Because the counts are very high and the fluid is a bit hazy. But an empire is a complication of a pneumonia. We heard this morning on a panel that it's an uncomplicated effusion, a complicated, then an empyema. How can this empyema come in 12 hours? Again, giving you a clear idea that those counts mean nothing. Those counts can be on anything. Now, such a high count could only mean that there is just an inflammation. Naturally, he had no response to antibiotic. He had no response to drainage. Finally, it was simply a tuberculous pure effusion. Why should TB not cause such a count? After all, those counts indicate a severity of inflammation and a tuberculous pleural effusion is an acute allergic inflammation. Inflammation is same whether it's allergic, traumatic or whatever. And therefore, a clinician should be very careful of interpreting such reports. This was a four month old presented with high fever and irritability for three days. Physical examination except irritable child, there was nothing localized. Considering that it could be a meningitis because of irritability. But look at the fun. Four month old. High fever for three days. Is he waiting to demonstrate clinical findings? Is he waiting to throw up a seizure? What is he doing for three days with a bacterial meningitis? A clinician should have been guarded and said, Oh, this is some, some funny meningitis. Meningitis is alright. He is irritable. So you do a CSF and you pick up a meningitis. Cells are high. But polys are not so high. You start wondering whether it is viral, whether it's tubercle, etc. Now, with this treated with septraxa, four month old child, why think of anything else, a bacterial infection? And you have no response, why then the child develop blue stools? Now the science comes handy. Even an intravenous antibiotic can cause blue stools due to antibiotics secreted in the intestinal mucosa. Oh, so this must be an antibiotic related or maybe a coincidental infection. You are missing a boat that this child probably has never a meningitis typically, but still has a meningeal inflammation. And this child has a multi-system disease now. And that puts us to say, let's examine the urine. Oh, you have a UTI. Now from meningitis to diarrhea to UTI, what's the common thing? This was the Kawasaki. Again, meaning that a good clinician would have been able to pick up such things. Four year old presented with high fever for a week and itchy skin, rash, and cough for four days. Now, here is a child who has got a fever and therefore a cough and also itching. Dermatologist also saw it. He said, must be an allergic process. Cough is allergic, itching is allergic, skin rash. But here is a child who presents with fever. You do a count. Nothing much on the count, 
and then you do a chest x-ray because this child has got some cough and some fever, you are concerned what this is and it shows a mediastinal lymph nodes. But he is man to negative. <coughs> this morning we again had a panel which said that how we go by a thing. The point is that this child had an eosinophilia of 23. Now I am a strong believer that tropical eosinophilia is not a problem with children. But the moment you have a high eosinophil count, you give a dietal carbamacin and for maybe two or three weeks. This child had therefore no response. A repeat checks that say large lymph nodes. Point that I am making is again that if this child came with high fever for a week and he had not localized anywhere, well you could have thought of a tubercle as well, but if that was not to be considered, then the next was still a lymph node disease. And this certainly turned out to be a Hodgkin's lymphoma. Today we know that Hodgkin's can come with an itchy rash as well, a cough as well because of the pressure. The next patient was an 8 year old with purpuric spot, a typical ITP situation. A happy child, comfortable child with an acute onset purpura and when you do a platelet count, it's 2.5. So the hematologist was asked and he said, no, we must do a bone map. Now, if the child is so fine, he has an acute onset disease. What kind of bone marrow problem are you looking at? Therefore, you know that whenever the automated chambers are used for counts, a microcytic RBCs are counted as platelets and therefore a low platelet count was reported as a normal platelet count. Should the clinician not be so sure that this is not a bone marrow problem? Acute onset purpura in a happy child. But the hematologist said, once I have seen such a happy leukemia. Now, that, that becomes a problem. Good that we see only unhappy bone marrow problem. Okay. So, as you get super specialized, you recall the latest, rarest of the situation. And for you, everything is possible. For us, no. Everything is standard. And therefore, when you looked at the counts again, what's the message? When you have an automated chamber giving you a platelet count, always ask the pathologist to also do a manual. And generally, one platelet per high power field into 10,000 is the roughly a platelet count. And if it doesn't correlate, then you look at what's happening. This is a 10-year-old child with colic abdominal pain and loose tools with mucus open on three months. Looks like a bacillary dysentery. Why should a 10-year-old do all that? You have all the stool samples, yes, everything. But 10-year-old has no business to have a repeated bacillary dysentery. And therefore, this is certainly an inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, this is the two-year-old with periorbital puffiness on getting up in the morning. No other complaints. But when you ask, examine correctly, you find that the, even the lips are swollen and there is a periorbital edema. You do a urine protein. Okay, it's two plus. You say it must be a beginning of a nephrotic syndrome. Now, this is the problem with urine protein. Urine protein may be negative in a random sample in a nephrotic and a 1 plus 2 plus is just a qualitative measure and therefore you must learn to do a urine protein creatinine and I think when you do that, you know that this is no proteinuria at all and this child had just an angioedema. Again, how does the test can misguide you? This was a year old child with generalized weakness and poor weight since early infancy and past episodes of repeated fever treated each time with antibiotics. Physical examination 5.2 kilo length 64 is moderately pale, he has signs of rickets. Now, here is a malnourished child who seems to have got rickets as well. So it must be a, not a simple deficiency rickets, it must be something beyond that. And therefore you did a serum creatinine which was 0.6 milligram. And the lab says up to 1.2 is normal. We all know that uh, serum creatinine depends on the muscle mass and the length or height of the child. And therefore, we need not get bogged down by that normal report. And I am sure that if you calculate a GFR of this child, then the serum creatinine is much higher. <coughs> I feel we all know the uh, formula for calculating the eGFR. But the simplest way would be a height in centimeters. Make three-fourth of it and put a decimal. That's the maximum serum creatinine accepted. 
so 100 centimeter height for five year old child make three fourth of it 75 0.75 can be the higher limit of serum creatinine which is an easy formula to go by reasonably good enough for a clinician and that correlates reasonably well with an EGFR so this is where we stand on that seven days old neonate was noticed to have a diaper stain with blood the parent brought the diaper and said Last night, twice this child passed a blood in the urine. The child is happy and exclusively breastfed. Urine showed RBCs and therefore a stent for culture. Culture showed equal. How difficult it is to collect the sample. Mm -hmm. When is it sent? After how many hours it is processed? But it showed more than one lakh colonies. So our science says this is a UTI. And there is a immaturity. And therefore, you are would do a USG, MCU, etc. We saw in the morning. And when you call everything normal, you still start antibiotics because it's an acute UTI. And then plan a DMS scan thereafter. You forgot that this child had only twice that diaper which was stained and happily feeding thereafter. If you are asked how does an acute UTI come in a small, small infant, it doesn't come with immature necessarily. And the child is almost like septic child. Sepsis, this child is so normal and therefore this was a female child with just a withdrawal bleeding and this child was put to so much of all kinds of problems. This is another six week old infant presented with fresh blood in stools for two days, painless, exclusive breastfeeding. This is another issue that many times you see all this and you investigate. The PT and APTT was I mean, abnormal. Don't forget that most of the labs do not have an age match control. They have an adult control. And a small infant up to first two months or so cannot have the same kind of PT, PTT reading. And therefore the lab says that you have an increased PT and therefore you follow that. And that's another thing that you keep in mind. Six year old, very umbilical abdominal pain. Okay, this is another common situation. You do an ultrasound. Today I do an ultrasound, I tell the parent, there will be lymph nodes. There will be some uh, uh, bladder wall thickened. There will be some intestinal wall thickened. Don't get worried. I will interpret. Once the report comes, it appears that you are defending your earlier statement that the child is alright. Some of these things are so common, which only means that the ultrasound machines have become better. Ultrasonologists have a better vision, but not an application of what they are saying. And we clinicians never tell them, we just tell them do an abnormal ultrasound and find something on all this. Poor sonologists feel, you are a great clinician, there must be something wrong. So he put something wrong. And I think this is a common situation. A two-year-old presented with pallor, mild icterus, not sick, they were just palpable pain. Now when you have an icterus and you have a anemia, it's a hemolytic anemia. But there's no spleen at all, and coming it for the first time, you do a routine count, yes, it's pancytopenia. Hematologist said, oh, this pancytopenia, uh, unexplained pancytopenia, but why is the icterus there? And therefore, pancytopenia with icterus meant simply a B12 deficiency, MCP was high, that was not looked into. Again, this. Eight year old presented with fever off and on for the last three months. Diagnosed probably TB. I'm getting this point because I was asked to see the child and I thought on a decent ground a clinician has put it as TB, though we had no proof. He had tried gastric lavas, man 2, etc., but nothing was so. I also said that with no definite proof, I would still call it TB. We started treatment, but there was no response. Thereafter, I said no, a mediastinal lymph node, let's do an invasive biopsy and get a sample. We did that and to have that, lovers was negative, Igra was negative, CBNAT was negative. Mediastinal lymph node biopsy was also not suggested. But finally the MGIT grew after three weeks and years. A point that after multiple tests, one test could be abnormal and that is how we go by. I think these are often misused tests and I feel they are not worth. To me, the CRP is not a good test. Well, I hear scientists saying all that, but CRP has never helped me in my practice at all. 
it only differentiates a healthy from not healthy. <laughs> and that I think everybody knew. To me, procalcitonin is a higher limit of abnormality that you expect. No, Cal procalcitonin gets abnormal in four hours. Tomorrow there will be a test. Before the jumps come in, it will be positive. <laughs> I won't believe that. So I don't think in a routine thing it's not there. And therefore, I will just sum up. Uh, can I have my last slide? But I have nothing more to say really. I will just say that there are some situations where you need more tests. I'm not talking against tests. But there has to be a reason. Like, let's not forget to do C3 in acute glomerulonephritis. So that we will not miss something which is not simple acute glomerulonephritis. We must demonstrate that the CT has come up. And we must do a periodic renal function test in a surgically operated renal problem. And we must do a repeated liver function test in a surgically operated. When we were trained, the surgeons used to bark at us, oh, you give us a biliary atresia early. You give us an obstructive uropathy early. Now they know that what is early is already several months late. And a posterior urethral valve pelgurated at hour one of life ultimately runs into a chronic renal failure. Who is to monitor his height at least and creatinine, etc. So I'll just summarize. Tests without any provisional diagnosis are not helpful but often confusing. Tests done after therapeutic trial often fail to offer correct interpretation and even may mask the disease. No place for random testing to rule out uh, every possibility. And I think self-audit and introspection is the only way to pave rationality. Thank you very much.